Masa al Kair, which means good evening or good afternoon in Egyptian Arabic. And um, every time I do these, I, well, first off, I initially looked it up in Klingon. I really wanted to talk in Klingon this week. Um, but then I realized there's no word for hello in Klingon. It's just like a really aggressive, like, what do you want type thing. And um, every week I think about how many people I'm probably pissing off when I butcher these. And it brought me back to over the pandemic when Doug Ford was talking in all these like different uh, languages and tell people to stay home. <laughs> uh, if y'all don't know Doug Ford, he's the, the Ontario premier, okay? A very funny, funny guy. A very famous brother who was uh, doing recreational drugs when he was the mayor of Toronto. <laughs> R.I.P. to him, though. He's a, he's a good guy. Good guy. Uh, that's debatable. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> that's crazy. Right, um, but yeah, so there was a point in time where he was, like, telling people in, like, their native tongues to, like, stay home. And I remember one time he, was, he used, like, Patois, and it was the funniest thing I've ever heard of in my life. He's, like, his translation to stay home, he's, like, Ten yard. And it was, like, him in his, like, deep-ass voice. Oh, my God, man. It was on Twitter for like three days. If y'all have never seen it, search up Doug Ford Patois. It is legit the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he just sits there, straight face, and like deep voice. Like not even, like he didn't even try to like play it off like a actual Patois speaker. He's mm. like, no, I am who I am. Ten a yard. And nice. I, I couldn't sleep for weeks. I just kept seeing it in my nightmares. If you want uh, other good Ford content, look up Doug Ford Timbit. I'm not going to describe the video to you. Look that up on YouTube. And then also look up Rob Ford's Greatest Moments if you want a really good laugh. Uh, I, yeah. wa I watch that at least once a year. So, Our politicians are very colorful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I uh, mean, I think America has that too. So, I don't think we're at America level, but we can we can compete a little bit. Yo, just just look it up. Just trust us. Just look it up. Look up like Doug Ford, Rob Ford, best moments, and get back to us. This is like with the Defos thing, we didn't mislead you. We taught you some useful stuff. This is the same thing. Okay, your life will get better, yeah. guaranteed. So this <laughs> week, uh, we are well. Kieran's about to hop on a flight to UIC. Yep. I'm not going. I have an athletic banquet this weekend, and like fifteen hundred dollars to go to UIC. I was like, uh, maybe not this year. So I'm not going. I'll be watching on the sidelines, which feels really, really weird. Because I mean, I love these events, like the big tourneys, the big big stage, all that stuff, but I'll be cheering all of you on, and so we are here today to give you our, like, top three picks with lists, with, like, our own personal lists of what we're probably, well, what I would have played and what Kieran is going to play, so we're going to go through that one by one. Uh, we tried not to have the same decks on our both of our lists, but unfortunately, one did cross over, and I'm sure you guys can all understand which deck that already is. Um, so, okay, so before we even get into that, like, what are your thoughts going to USC? Like, obviously, there's a lot of developments going on uh online yeah. and like in person there's been a couple events so what are you thinking yeah there's been um i mean we've talked about this before like with the online era like so many new decks like our list enter the meta like i swear like not even every week like every day with all these like random online tournaments uh so yeah. at least for me it's like i don't have enough time to like just like ping pong like all over the place like playing all these different decks so i've mainly just picked a couple decks and like have really stuck to testing those um and it's like my philosophy right it's like it's better to be like 95 to 100 percent proficient in one deck than to play like a slightly better deck but be like 70 percent proficient so i haven't been like jumping all over the place like testing heavily every single deck like i'm aware like what every deck does i've played against every deck pretty much but i've been really focusing just on a couple yeah yeah that makes sense and i feel like especially like with the way this has been going and like even so this is the thing so we normally record on mondays like full disclosure for all y'all we record on mondays and uh this week we're recording on a tuesday and from that one extra day, we gained, like, a tournament with, like, 300 participants that had a lot of, like, really good info. So, like, you, what you're saying with, like, yo, every day is something new and you get so much info, it's, it's absolutely correct. Like, there's almost too much info. Yep. And to the point where, like, you see some of these decks, like, doing well once and you start to think, like, oh, maybe this could be legit. But there are, like, these one-off tournaments where, I mean, people aren't as good or not as many people play. So I think it actually, like, skews data a lot as well. So... Bit of both, like take it with a grain of salt, of course. But yeah, I'm on the same train as you. I think like we don't play the game as much, I think, as some other people. And um, you like to optimize your testing, right? When you've been playing for a long time and stuff, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Like you've kind of seen some of these archetypes before. Like you've seen like how rotations work. You've seen how, what people play to ICs and stuff. So you can kind of limit yourself in that sense. That being said, we both have our three picks that we think that have the best chance to win the tournament. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, neither of us have stall, full disclosure, but I do think stall is like my number four. That's like my honorable mention for sure. Yeah. Um, I would say, too, right? so I just said this is like my top three picks of what I'm considering. If I actually 
made a tier list with top three decks in the format, I would definitely put Stall in the top three. Um, yeah. I just don't want to play Stall, so <laughs> it's not on my top three choices. <laughs> so I guess just briefly before we dive into our list, like I've been thinking about like Snorlax versus Pidgeot Stall. Um, I feel like if you're really good at playing Stall, Pidgeot's probably slightly better. It has more flexibility. I will say though, in my testing, I have found that like Pidgeot Stall sometimes is more susceptible to losing because you play more two prize Pokemon. Uh, so your opponent mm-hmm. can like really accelerate the game, like and also like your starts get punished more with that version of the deck. Um, but the thing with Snorlax is, is like it folds really heavily to like techs. Like if someone plays one minier, like Snorlax doesn't really have a good answer. Um, so I don't know, like the Pidgeot version is just more flexible. So I think if you feel like you're a confident pilot of the of the archetype, that that one probably makes more sense. If you just want to play control, you don't have time to grind games. Like I'd probably just play Snorlax. So. Yeah, I forget who it was. I saw it on Twitter where someone was like, yeah, Snorlax Stall is just like literally you're just throwing things in the active. You're not really using your brain a whole lot. Yep. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why like Stall, I guess, now isn't as popular as it maybe it used to be. Just because like the old Stall variants, like with uh, Bellaba Bryson Man and all that <laughs> stuff, like they were a little bit more intricate. Not by much, but it definitely felt like there was a little bit more gamesmanship, go- gamesmanship going on. Whereas now it's like, all right, uh, Penny, yeah, loop it, Bravery Charm, whatever, right? So mm-hmm. it's not as appealing. Um, but to me, I do think Stall is in like one of the best positions it's ever been in, like modern uh, Pokemon. I think it's in a great spot. Um, the best like S tier decks don't have an answer to it for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens. Um, let's dive right in here though. Um, we're gonna be giving like our list as well. So for everybody listening on Spotify, uh, I'm sorry. That's all I got for you. you you'll see it on your screen if this is YouTube. We'll do our best to describe. Or maybe it we can well. put links in the description or something to like the images uh, yeah. of the Spotify thing. So, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so let's start. Okay, let's start with your number three, Karen. Uh, we'll go three, three, two, two, one, one. We'll go from there. Okay. Uh, so my number three of what I've been actually playing. I think this might be surprising, but I actually have the Roaring Moon Dunsparce <laughs> deck. I actually like love this deck. It's like way better than I thought it was gonna be. Like. Uh, so it's called Good Friend of the Pod, Mike Fouché. He was like texting our like Discord, being like, "Oh, I'm on like an 11 game win streak with this deck," and he sh- showed me the list, and I'm like, "Hey, this looks horrible." Uh, and then I played some games. And I'm like, "Oh, this deck is actually pretty decent. Um, like it prize trades really well, is which is why I think the deck is good." So uh, you have Baby Moon, which is actually a really good attacker in the early game. Uh, it has like a non-trivial amount of HP. Like it has 140, and you play four capsules, so you can do 200. And the way I found the deck works is, like, okay, you, like, attack with Baby Moon. Like, a lot of decks need a two-prize Pokemon to respond. Then you just go Roaring Moon. And, like, you don't even care if you frenzied Gouging because uh, you're ahead by two prizes, so they knock out your Roaring Moon. If they use a single prizer, you just single prize them. If they use a two prizer, you just Roaring Moon EX again. So I've actually found, as long as I take prize leads with the deck, like, it's very good. Um, Dunsparce having free retreat has felt really good. It's a good starter. It's a good pivot. The Dunsparce basically just protects me against Iono and, like, Roxanne. Like, I feel like I'm just fine. Like, you have the four three line. Uh, and the deck's just really fun to play. So uh, I haven't had as much time to like, put into it. I started playing this deck on, I think, Sunday or Saturday. Um, but yeah. I've actually really liked it. And I feel like it's an archetype like I'll explore more, especially after EUIC, maybe going to Orlando. I don't know if you've played this deck. Feels like... but... Yeah, sorry. Um, what I was going to say is like, it also feels like, like you said, the Rory Moon Baby has such like, a weird amount of HP yeah. that like most decks can't even punish it. Like I think even like Chen Pao no, or Chen Pao something can't. that plays hands. <laughs> what do you do <laughs> yeah champ is a really good matchup for the deck uh at least for my testing yeah. it's like they don't have a good answer like they have to, if they want they can chen pao knock out your um baby moon but then you just like roy moon ex them and you just win the trade so i found chen pao what they have to do is they have to like moonlight shuriken just play like 90 90 on like two baby moons if there's two in play and then super odd greninja again like trade that way um but... how uh how much health does dunsparce have uh, it only has 70 or 60, I think. Yeah, 60. I have it open here. 60, and the, the Dunsparce has 140. Um, okay, so like as long as you're smart and you don't bench two Dunsparce at once, yeah, to exactly. Jump out, you're normally okay. Yeah, so you just yeah. bench one, and then if you evolve to the Dunsparce, it's fine to bench another one. Um, so, and that seems like the ultimate like prize trading deck. Like people like commend Chen Pao for being such a good like board manager and just like giving your opponent whatever they don't want. I feel like this deck is, like, very, very similar. Like, you're only managing yeah. EX if you need it. Like, obviously, you can run away with just Roaring Moon Baby, and you just get more powerful over time, which is really weird for one prizer. Yeah, and it's, uh, what's it called? Like, once you get to the later stage of the game, like, Baby Moon can knock out, like, the Chen Pao's, can knock out, like, Rotom's, like, stuff like that. So it's it's almost impossible to knock out, like, the, like, 280 HP stuff with uh, Baby Moon, but uh, I did it one game, so. Uh, no. I did it once. Yeah, I did it once. 
uh, I don't know. I just, I've been really enjoying the deck. I think it's really fun. Um, so I think it's probably a tier two deck. And it, it's one big problem is Mist Energy. Um, so I guess Lugia. So I've considered putting Temple of Sinnoh in, but like right now I'm playing four Artisan. Like Artisan just feels so good for grabbing Baby Moon, for grabbing Dunsparce early. Um, and then some Charizard lists play Mist, but you can just boss around it. But uh, yeah, or just Seems trade. Good. Or you can just trade, like it's fine. If you have to trade two Baby Moons for like one, two Prizer, that's fine as well. So yeah, the deck has been a pleasant surprise uh, for me, for sure. Is there anything uh, specific about your list you wanted to point out, or mostly just cookie cutter? Not really. It's like pretty similar to the list that won uh, that like online tournament. Like that's where this deck came mm. from. Um, like not really. It just plays a bunch of consistent council cards. Like it plays Prime Catcher instead of like the Awakening Drum because that card kind of sucks. It's not that it sucks. Yeah. It's just Prime Catcher's too good. Uh, yeah. No. It's just this is a linear deck, which is normally like not how I like to play, but. Um, just a linear deck. It does what it's supposed to do very well, and it's, it's a good deck. Seems like a good gar- a good dark horse. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a good dark deck. horse. Yeah, it's a dark horse for sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, any like we'll respond to questions too in the chat in the uh, comments. If you have any questions about these decks, let us know. We'll respond the best we can. Um, obviously, UIC is in what two days when you're watching this or listening to this. So yeah, not a whole lot of time to, to turn around, but hopefully you brought these cards with you. <laughs> um, so my number three, and this is, this one is really like as surprising to me as I think it is going to be to hear. Um, but my number three is Gardevoir. Surprisingly, it is, uh, I know there's a lot of discourse about Gardevoir more recently about like how people thought like, yes, it's going to be completely dead. And it's just, it's just not, to be honest, it feels like a consistent, like tier two, Honestly, it could compete if it really catches steam into tier one. If it's uh, if a lot of people don't play the counters to it, a lot of vacuums. Like obviously, it has a few bad matchups. Uh, you can see my list on the screen here right now. Um, the the main thing is your tools, right? That's a lot of what this is, and it, it kind of comes down to: Does your opponent play vacuum? <laughs> <laughs> if your opponent plays vacuum, this turns really scary really fast. But in my initial like testing, I haven't seen a lot of like those like three prize swing turns. Um, there's also like, it, from what I've seen, a lot less vacuum going around just cause path has gone and there's a lot less to kind of vacuum it seems. So like you're obviously in on my notes here, like I literally wrote out all the matchups and on negative, it's anything with vac LOL. So there's that, <laughs> uh, future hands is really bad for obvious reasons. Lost zone's not great. I think, uh, I think 10 pounds is bad. Great. Yeah, ten pounds. And for how is this number three? Right? <laughs> what good matchups do we have? <laughs> it, well, you take good matchups with Lugia, Arctina, regular Tina. You're okay in Dizard. Like it seems like the top stuff you can actually beat. Okay, which is uh, pretty good. Um, the one thing I will say about this list per- particularly is it plays one candy, and it, it obviously plays Gallade, so you can pick out whatever you want. Um, you play Turo, you play Palpat. Like you have you you have outs in the stall. It's not great. Um, the one card I was considering cutting is Mew EX. Uh, okay. It just feels like it gives your opponent another two prize out sometimes when you just don't really want to present that. Uh, but it does help into some like more unsuspecting variants that may play a Greninja and you can kind of snipe off their benches and stuff. Um, what I will say about this deck is it is definitely more like Garvor EX attacking heavy uh, than it <laughs> used to be because you, you obviously lose Arcanus. So you have a lot more uh, a lot more like awkward turns, I would say. There's a lot of turns where like your attacker isn't really well-defined. Um it's it's a weird way to kind of put it, but you don't really have like a, a cookie cutter attacker for everything kind of thing. So mm-hmm. that was a weird part for me, like kind of getting over that hump. I saw, uh, I think it was Hunter Gibbon who did really well into a couple of late nights with this deck, and um, there was a long like tweet thing about it. Uh, what are they called? Tweet threads or X threads? Are they still called tweets? I think they're called posts, but I mean I still call them tweets and I call it Twitter still. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's a long like post thread about it, about like why the deck is actually better than most people think. And I don't know, to be honest, I don't know if I'd have the guts to play this to an IC, but uh, that's why it's third, because I don't think I would have the guts to play this. But it's a it's a good pick, and I think it's actually really, really strong. So if you're going to League Cups or something this weekend or even next weekend, like definitely pick this deck up. I think it will be very surprising to a lot of people how strong it actually is. And I wish I did not put as much time into it as I have, but I've put in a lot of time into trying to resurrect Gardevoir, and it's actually been surprisingly good. So that is my number three. Cool. I've played zero games, actually, of Gardevoir in this format. I've just completely written it off. So uh, when I Fair finish enough. EUIC and Neil, maybe I'll play some games with Gardevoir. Because I, I am obviously... You should. It's actually fun. I love Gardevoir, like the past iteration of it. So um, I'll see if I enjoy this one. So nice. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, let's go into your number two, which I believe... No, sorry, our number ones are the same, I believe, Yeah, right? yeah our number ones are the same, which is fine. Yeah. 
So uh, we can go into your number two, and then uh, we'll cover number ones at the end. Cool. So yeah, number two for me is just Charizard, I think. Um, I don't think it's surprising to say that. Like, I think everyone knows that this deck is really good. Um, I really like the list that Luke Soldale won the Tournament of Doom online tournament with. Um, so what makes that list special is there's a copy of Aerie and a copy of Technical Machine Devolution. Um, mainly just to target Chen Pao's. And TM Devolution is obviously very strong in the mirror match as well, since you can keep your, your opponent's damage numbers low. Um, and just like from testing Charizard a lot, it's just like Pidgeot's just such a good card. And it's like, it's hard to play around Charizard. And uh, I can't understate enough like how much I think collectively we underrated the maximum belt when it came out or got revealed uh it like completely changes how charizard plays because i think the problem charizard had before is like you can kind of just sit there against the deck um and just wait and like you can get a nice setup before you're ready to start engaging in the prize trade but the maximum belt just puts a lot of pressure on a ton of decks like, against chen pao like they, it's not safe for them to open chen pao anymore uh which is i found like really made the matchup a lot closer um which i really like um like just the pri like 330 HP is a lot in this format. Um, you can play Mist Energy, so like you don't have to worry about getting Star Requiem or Frenzied Gouging. And like it just feels like the deck can play so many techs right now just because of how Pidgeot works. Um, so like, I'm very confident in saying that like Pidgeot's like way better than Bibril. Um, it's just like way easier to play the deck. Like you can play all these like one of cards. You can play the Devolution, you can play the Air, you can play the Choice Belt, you can play the Maximum Belt, like you can play the Mist, and like it's not hard to grab the cards. So um the deck's been testing really well it's like a very vanilla deck but it's just so strong like it's power level is so high uh so i think it's just like it's probably the safest deck if you had to pick a safe deck to play the tournament it's definitely charizard and that's like the exact mentality that we've talked about a couple times where like when people go so far for ICs and stuff they want to play the safe deck <laughs> yep. and that's why like i think i mean like this isn't as clear of an s tier as i thought it might have been mm -hmm. But uh, I, if this was, like, even a little bit better, I feel like you could see, like, some crazy percentage numbers with this. I still do think it will be the most played deck in the room. I'm just not sure by how much. Yeah. Um, good idea to take a good matchup into Charizard, I think, <laughs> going into this IC, that's for sure. Yeah, it's interesting, because um, there's not that many decks that have a good matchup into Charizard, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I'd say Stall has a good matchup into Charizard. I'd say Lugia has a good matchup into Charizard. But Lugia bricks itself half the time. Uh I don't know, depending on the Charizard build, like I'd still say Chen Pao is like slightly favored into Charizard. Uh, if you play like this airy Devo stuff, like it's probably like closer to even. Maybe slightly yeah. favored for Charizard if the Chen Pao player like gets unlucky. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Like it's top a thousand twenty four gets points. I'm pretty sure at this IC. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, when I was doing like my matchup spreads like in preparation for this video, I noticed that like everything is kind of like even in Desired, and Zard's kind of even into everything. It's kind of like that Chen Pao kind of same feeling, where if you're like a you're experienced with the deck, good player, whatever, like you you kind of know the matchups, like you can expect to do quite well with this deck, just because all those matchups are so even, they're so fifty fifty, then you can kind of rely on skill a little bit. Um, the one thing I do like about Zard a lot, and you touched on this, is just this ability to nitpick whatever you need at any time. And like with Path Gone, I think people underestimate how reliable that really is now yep. um we're not really used to not having much disruption around and that's uh that's a huge huge thing so i think zard has a lot of potential for for techs as well like we kind of saw it with the zools group into vancouver like a lot of different techs a lot of things to improve certain matchups and just because you have that nitpick ability with with pidgeot to get whatever you want i wouldn't be surprised to see like a zard with like a couple Aries or something do well like that's something that i could definitely can see happening yep. um my one concern with Aries and zard is that like you are kind of reliant on your supporters in early turns yep. and like it is a little sketchy to not have arvin and like have your hand filled with like aries and stuff so um I, well i guess you play for arvin anyway but yeah. like you know what i mean like not having other supporters yeah so, i get what you're saying that's the only concern i have yeah you have to find a turn to play airy and i've thought of it like I, obviously i play chen pao a lot so it's like normally the best turn to airy chen pao is turn one or two before they start doing yeah. stuff because that's when they're not going to have used their super odds their super retrievals their candies yet like, once the game gets going, like, they're probably going to super retrieval every time it's in their hand. They're probably going to super odd whenever it's in their hand. So, just the chances of hitting with Aerie kind of go down. Um, it's obviously, like, an insanely high-impact card if you hit it. Um, like, sometimes, like, they like they can't discard some of the cards in their hand and you'll hit. But, like, it's a little bit of a gamble, like you're saying. But once Charizard gets set up, like, it's kind of low-maintenance sometimes. Like, once you have all your Charizards, like, you don't really need to be, like, doing a lot every turn. Um, so, that yeah. you can normally find a turn to go for the Aerie. But yeah, I agree. It's like, it is a little awkward sometimes to, to find the right turn to play Aerie, so. It's like Misfortune and like Erica's. You're yeah. just like, 
if it hits, it hits. Yep. If it doesn't, you're like, all right, whatever. But as long <laughs> as you're on a turn, like you said, where you're low maintenance, you don't really care. Yeah. Like, what's the harm, right? Just play exactly. a couple and see what happens. It's like, um, yeah, no. Yeah, I, I would just say, like, it has the chance to, like, win games on the spot. Like, that's why the card is, like, good. Like, even mm-hmm. if the card, like, like, even, I, I think the hit rate's higher. But, like, let's say the hit rate's, like, 20%. Like, if there was a supporter that just said, like, have a 20% chance to win the game on the spot like and that's just what the card effect did otherwise it does nothing like yeah. you would probably still play it in most decks like to have like a home run swing so uh no i think it's it's good i think it's i think most of the lists are gonna play it this weekend yeah and i mean we'll talk about this when we get to our number one there's you got to kind of play around it a little bit uh yeah. I, like i if i was going to uic i would be terrified of that card <laughs> and i think most people should be to be honest play down your ultra balls play down everything kind of i don't know we'll see um, okay, so actually, you know what, before we move on, I want to get your take on, uh, Beebzard, just before we move on there. Yeah, I mean, like, it's not, like, bad, it's just, like, Pidgeot's just, like, such a good card, like, and Path is gone, so I'm like, why would I not just play Pidgeot? Uh, like, if I play Beebzard, it's, like, it's kind of hard to play stuff like Aerie, it's hard to play stuff like Mist Energy, it's hard to play stuff like Devo, because it's, like, I can't just, like, draw it, like, when I need it, um... And I think uh, initially people were like, oh, we're playing Bibzard because it has a better Chen Pao matchup. But, like, honestly, I think now with this new iteration of Pidgezard, like, I feel like a Chen Pao matchup is close to 50-50 anyways. So, um, yeah, I just I don't think you need to be playing Bib. Um, I just think the uh, Quick Search is too good to forgo in this format. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm also not convinced that Chen Pao is going to be as big as people think. Um, like, all right, we'll get into that in a bit. I'll leave that for now. Uh, all right. Uh, my second pick is Arctina. Uh, okay. This deck is, like, just, it's been around forever. You can't really seem to escape it. It's one of those decks that I think is very beginner-friendly as well. It's very, um, very hand-holdy in a sense. There mm-hmm. are There is a lot of space for, I think, um, like, tech inclusions and, like, u- list uniqueness. But I think when it comes to playing the deck, it's it's quite simple. You're gonna start with what you need, and then you're hitting with Tina, lost and backed over and over, drawing with Beebs. Um and these decks, historically, RC in particular, tends to do quite well at ICs. Um yeah. we saw a long period of time where Arc Pika was the best IC deck. <laughs> and even at Worlds, uh, I think it's twenty twenty two, um Arc Tina or sorry, Arc Pika, great yeah. deck. Um the the whole like Arceus barrel engine kind of getting what you need over time is really attractive to people. I think this build specifically with Max Belt gains so so much into Chen Pao into Charizard. Like you gain a lot overall into the field. Um, my big thing I think with Arc was the same thing that you said about Zard. There's a lot of times where you're set up, you're ready to go, but you're not swinging for KOs yet. Like you're kind of yep. you're not waiting so to speak, but you're kind of you need your your Teen Online to really one shot anything. So. Uh, Max Belt really helps with that. In my build, I have a Radiant Gardevoir. Um, I'm also not playing Airy, which I think is a mistake. I think this should mm-hmm. have a couple Aries in here. Um, I just don't know where the space would come from at the moment, so that's why this list does not have Airy. Yeah. Uh, I do think it's like one of the best cards in the format. I agree with you. I think Airy is like the underlying goat of this set. I think the problem with Airy in an Arceus deck is... Like, the reason it's good in Charizard is because you can Pidgeot for it. Like, Arceus, like, normally yeah. when you Starbirth, like, you Starbirth turn two, it's like... How often can you, like, afford or even want to Starburst for Aerie? Like, it just feels like it's one of those cards where, like, you have to draw it in the flow of the game and have a chance to play it. Um, which I don't know how many opportunities there's going to be for that. Uh, and especially to get no, it when I you agree. need it. So you probably have to play it in, like, higher counts. Like, at least two to three to draw it consistently. And then at that point, like, the opportunity cost of, like, just playing better cards. Like, boss, playing research, playing judge, playing whatever is probably better. So... Yeah, I don't know if it needs... Like, it's a nice card to have, but it just it doesn't feel like it fits this deck as well as it does Charizard. I've, I've tested with it quite a bit on ladder, and I, I agree. Like, there is times where you'd like it and you can't Starbirth for it, but I do think that with RCS, there's a little bit more throughout the game where there are more turns where you don't need a supporter, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, I think there's a lot more time and a lot more opportunity to use Airy. Like, if you draw a turn 4, turn 5, like I think it's still a good card. Whereas with Charizard, when it's turn four, turn five, like normally they've taken some prizes. You're looking for bosses to kind of swing and KO things. Um, Arceus, I think, just does a better job of just being a consistent, just just beat down deck, right? Yeah. So you combine that with disruption. We've seen it in the past, like Judge Path, whatever it might have been. It's very, very strong. And I think Airy into Zard, Airy into Chen Pao, just kind of makes those matchups even better. So to me, like I think if I were going to UIC, I would definitely play one, maybe two copies. Uh, where the cuts come from, that's another story. <laughs> Um, I, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna put a, a list on the screen of both, uh, <laughs> or what I'd cut because I need to, I need to think about this for a couple hours during editing <laughs> as to what I would cut. 
Um, but I definitely do think there's uh, there's a realm where it should play Aerie, and and I think other than that, the only the only thing you can really argue is a fourth RCSV star, maybe a three three Beebs. I've seen that kind of going around uh, just to improve your consistency. So yeah, I was gonna ask you too. What are your thoughts on the Aerodactyl V star? Because um, I do yeah. th- I do think it's interesting. I saw like I was just scrolling through like someone who got second at like a big online tournament here. They played the one one line because uh, your Lugia matchup is really bad with Arctina. Uh, Chinchinos destroy your deck. Lugia can mm-hmm. knock out the baby Vs before they evolve. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of back in that Silver Tempest format when some people are playing Aerodactyl. Do you think it's worth it, or is Lugia just not that big of a deck that you can kind of just ignore? Well, that's the thing. I think it's definitely definitely big enough to, to think about. Um, my issue with it, and we've talked about this in the past, is you have to go first, right? Yep. Um, you have to go first, and if you don't go first, or you're not playing against Lugia, it's two cards in your deck that are completely dead, for the most part. Yep. And I think the combination of that and combination with the idea that you need Starbirth to mostly play the game most of the time. I don't love it. Um, especially, I think if in a world where Lugia is a higher meta share, I think it definitely gains a bit more traction. But as of right now, like I think most projections show Lugia at like 4th or 5th most played overall. Like It's not an S tier. It's it's arguably a tier 1. So I, I think in that world, like you're probably not playing Aerodactyl V-Star, but in a world like back in the past when Lugia was like 20, 30 percent, oh hell yeah, <laughs> give me two two Aerodactyl. I don't care. Like I'm just trying to shut that thing down. Then you go crazy, right? Yeah, I think uh, I was just looking here on the limitless thing. Like Lugia is the fourth most popular deck. Like I wouldn't be surprised if my guess is going to be it's going to be around that 10 percent range at UIC Lugia. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's not on my top three choices, but it is probably like I think it's like a tier 1.5 deck. Like, if every game I could guarantee I'm getting turn 2 Summoning Star Double Archeops, then yes, this is S-tier deck. But I can't guarantee that. And, like, it even, like... Yeah. It felt bad to start playing Burnett, like, once we had rotation last year, and it feels, like, horrible to start playing Shock in this deck now, so... Um, honestly, if you face and Lugia, think, your game plan can just be they're, they're gonna brick. <laughs> yeah. And I think the the presence of hands and how, like, un, how much of an unknown feature yep. box is right now doesn't help. And I think... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Lugia go crazy. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. to see Lugia win the tournament. Yeah, Lu- it has the potential. Lugia is a deck where it's like, let's say, like, uh, okay, so if ten percent of people play it at UIC, that's like two hundred fifty people. Like, there's gonna be some people who just like they run hot and like run ride that wave like to top cut. Like, like Lugia is a like probably the most powerful deck of the format. Um, once mm-hmm. it gets going, you just gotta gotta get there. So, uh, like, well, yeah, like whenever I play games, where I'm like, oh, I got turn two summoning star with a Chinchino. I'm like, this is literally unlosable. Uh, but a lot of games, I'm like half my games. I'm like turn two. I'm like, all right, let's read the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And like you, you've touched on it too. Like it does have a little bit more time to do that now. Yep. You, you can kind of just read the wind sometimes. But I, uh, I definitely think Lugia is like the the banger bust choice of the weekend. It's going to be one or the other. So mm-hmm. we'll see how it goes. Um, all right. So to our number ones, which happen to be the same, uh, I will put both of our lists on the screen right now. Um, I'm sure they they vary a little bit. Um, so my list right now plays a three two Beebs. I'm kind of mm-hmm. undecided on this. Sorry, I should I should preface that the deck is Chen Pal. <laughs> I uh, forgot to say that for our Spotify listeners. Um, I'm playing a three two Beebs right now. Yep. Um, I don't know. What what are your thoughts on this whole like Beebs versus Backs Caliber debate? Like, there's a lot of three two Backs Caliber, a lot of three two Beebs, a lot of three three Beebs. Like, what's what's your take here? Yeah, um, I mean, Bibrel is like the lifeline of the deck almost. Um, so I I understand wanting to have a thicker Bibrel line. I don't really know if you need the three Bidoof, because like now that you have Buddy Puff and like it's a lot easier to get the Bidoof throughout the game. Like you do play Heavy Ball. Uh, one thing I saw that I thought was actually like more interesting to me is I see some people play two three Bibrel. Um, yeah. Which I, I, I actually like that more than three two Bibrel because I find it's easier to get Bidoof than it is to get Bibrel. Like you have to all twelve for it. So I think that's actually interesting. Um, I'm playing three two backs right now still. Um, I don't know, it's just like, Lost City is not really a card, like, you don't really need, you play, like, my list plays triple super odd, it's like, I don't really feel like I need the third back Excalibur. Um, that's mm-hmm. kind of where I'm at with those counts. Yeah, I was at 3-3 three, three Beebs for a long time, and I actually really loved it. Yeah, I it love it too. so consistent. And I think the, like, one of the major downfalls of Chen Pao, and, like, what we've been seeing in, like, common discourse online is, like, the, the consistency, issue, consistency issues is what's holding it back, for the most part. Um, a combination of that with like airy with like other hate and stall and stuff like that like that's what's kind of holding it back because like when this deck gets in the game when it plays the game it's uh it's really really good into a lot of things you have answers to almost everything so i really like that um my build right now uh has like only the two chen pows the three two backs like you're kind of banking on the idea of no lost city 
if you're looking to counter Chen Pao, like Velocity is one of like the first cards I would look at. Devo, Airy, stuff like that. Like there are a lot of answers to this. Um, but I do think overall this is definitely my number one choice going into the weekend. I know it's your number one choice. Um, just going through matchups in general, like you take such strong matchups into almost everything but stall for the most part. Yeah. And uh, I guess Roaring Moon as well. Uh, yeah, like, like I guess like the ancient box type stuff. Yeah, like you'll lose. But I mean, like for me, it's number one mainly because like I know how to play this deck the best out of all the meta decks. Uh, and I yeah. honestly don't have a lot of time to like grind out all these games. Um, so I'm just most familiar with it. And like it's a tier one deck. So I'm like, all right, perfect. Let's play this. So, like I'm like 90, like 5% sure I'm going to play this. Um, and like you're saying, like, the matchup spread's really good, and I've loved Codebreakers, or whatever it's called, Cypher Maniacs, yeah, whatever, you, know we'll you know what I'm talking about, like the Codebreaker card, yeah. <laughs> I've loved that card, um, I think just having those extra, I mean, like, last format, I was playing four Irida, one Iono, and now, right now, I'm playing, like, uh, the four Irida, three Codebreakers, so I basically added two more supporter cards, uh, and it felt, like, amazing, um, the other thing is, I think I, I knew the card was going to be good, but like I, I didn't realize how good like Buddy Poffin was going to feel. Uh, like one of the big problems with Chen Pao, like before rotation is like turn one going first is like if I don't just raw draw Battle VIP pass and like get a or just draw my basics, like it's actually really hard to establish your board. Uh, but now like any point in the game, like you can just Buddy Poffin, like get the Bidoof, get the fridge. If I, I have to super odd one back, like get it back right away. Um, I think Buddy Poffin, like Chen Pao is the deck that uses the card the best. Like obviously Charizard uses it, but I honestly think Chen Pao uses the card like way better. Um, so it just, it feels like the deck's, consi like, the deck is still a little inconsistent sometimes, but it does feel like overall the consistency of the deck has, like, improved so much. Uh, so that to me is, like, why, like, I feel a lot more comfortable playing it in this format. And we've also lost, like, Path of Debris, so it's just, like, it just feels much yeah. better. And my, my other thing, too, with, like, I know I touched on this earlier, I do think Chen Pao is going to be a bit lower play rate than what we think, just because this deck, like, kind of has, like, that whole, like, Gardevoir mist around it, where, like... <laughs> Only the top players, I think, will play this deck. There's a lot of, um, like, I'm sure there will be some, like, random people who do pick this up as well, but it's way less beginner-friendly than most decks. And uh, you can kind of see in these online tourneys, like, I was going through it before this video, like, there are so many Chen Pao's, but <laughs> there are so many that just, like, don't really eclipse, like, that 500 win rate. And I think a lot of that is just, like, people, like, trying out the deck for the first time and stuff like that. Like, it takes a long time to kind of get it. And I think this one is now a little bit, less uh ex like intensive than it used to be before rotation but i definitely think there's still like a, a pretty steep learning curve to it yeah there is but i think people love playing chen pao like it is a really fun deck so i think a lot of people do like to play it um but like, mm -hmm. yeah like it, uh, my guess is going to be it's going to be around 10 percent um yeah of the metagame if i had to give a, a, a concrete guess uh, and then like just some other cards like that i'm not in my list right now that i'm considering i've actually been considering playing silene um it sounds really bad but like it's a really good counter to Aerie, and you play so many, like, one-of cards in Chen Pao, or, like, important cards, and I'm like, this is basically, like, a flex spot. Like, I'm assuming I'm going to flip one heads, like, that's just the expected value. Obviously, I could double yeah. tails, or I could double heads, but, like, it can basically function as, like, another prime catcher, so it just becomes boss. Like, it could function as, like, your fifth super retrieval. It could function as, like, your fourth candy. Like, it could function as, like, um, I don't know, like, if you get double heads, like, you can clone combo again if you want, like... I, don't, I just like it has like flexibility. I wish the card just straight up said put a card for your discard on top of your deck. That'd be a lot yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm gonna play this card, but I'm like I've been thinking about it. If since Airy is getting more popular, like I was like, oh maybe I'll put fourth candy. Like I even considered like uh, the stage one, the Arcty backs. I'm like, I'm like Silene seems like it actually might just be a little better because you are a deck that can just draw whatever you put back right away. So like if I put back like Prime Catcher, it's like all right, Pokey Stop, Bibril, Greninja. So that's a card I've been been considering. Um, I've considered fourth candy. I've considered Arctabax just because of like the Devo and the Aries, like seeing more play if they snap their candies. Um, but yeah, like I feel like the deck is it's just so tight on space with a lot of these cards. It's like it's hard to find the the cuts to make for for these. I actually tested Arctabax. I know I was mentioning it to you earlier. Yeah. Um, I tested Arctabax. It's actually really good. Uh, surprisingly, and the thing I, I failed to consider like when I first put it in is it, like at the very worst it's just fodder like yeah. <laughs> you can just get rid of it whenever and it's nice for those like in between turns like i don't find it helpful getting up my first backs obviously but like yeah. when the, we're in the game and like there's a turn where your opponent can maybe like boss knock out your backs with an iono and you're in trouble it's really nice just to steadily evolve that fridge and um i found that obviously it's really good into devo but it's also just like it's just a like, good steady card like you can go yeah. first I don't know, miss uh, miss your Rakeni backs on the turn two, and at least get down the Arctabax, and you're kind of uh, you're kind of okay. You can prioritize your Ultra Balls into 
the barrels. Um, you don't need to really irida for candy as much. You can kind of use that to find Ultra Ball. So I really liked it so far. Uh, would it get into my list if I was playing this weekend? Probably not. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things that is just like you're, you're kind of sacrificing consistency cards somewhere to fit this in. So I don't know if I'd play it immediately, but it's definitely an answer. It's definitely something to consider that was a little bit better than I initially thought. Yeah, so maybe I'll mess around with it. Uh, but yeah, it definitely feels like a 63rd type of card right now. Uh, like yeah. some other cards I have right now that I've considered I've considered cutting mana fee. Uh, its main use cases are going second into Mirror and going second into Lost Box to block a ninja. I mean, like I feel like you can maybe get away without it. Like that's a deck space because it doesn't really have that much utility against the rest of the format. Um, mm hmm other thing, I've considered cutting the cologne. It also does feel like a bit of a luxury. Um, the thing I like about cologne, though, is like you have sometimes these games where you just get like bad starts, where like you start you go behind like a prize or two, and it's like being able to Greninja for two and like with a single prizer, like it fixes your prize map a lot of games. So it almost feels like a break glass in case of emergency type of card. Um, like I don't really feel like I need to use it from like a position of being ahead a lot, but I like that. It's like a soft counter to Snorlax. Like you probably still lose. Um, yeah. So I've considered cutting. <laughs> I don't that. play either of those cards yeah. actually. Yeah. So like, I've considered cutting both yeah. of those. Those are like my. Those are like I think those are like in the tech spots. Like you can play like more vessel. Um, I've considered also playing countercatcher again. It's like a similar idea to the clones. Like the fix your prize map. Um, I've considered. Um, what else have I considered? I think those are the main things I've considered. Like and then the other card I found that I like I really really like for the prize mapping is the iron bundle. Um, bundle. Yeah. It's felt really good. Um, just basically forcing them to give you something, either a two prizer or a baby Pokemon you can knock out with Iron Hands. It's been really good against Future Box because they're normally going to ride on you, and then you can just force them to give you a two prizer. Um, so I really like that card as well. I feel like it should be a staple in Chen Pao. Yeah, I, I played around with a lot of bundle, and I also cut it for a while. I cut it for about 15, 20 games for a counter catcher, mm -hmm. and I actually don't know which one I like better. They're both mm -hmm. really, really good. Um, obviously, it's situational. I kind of liked bundle better just because you can like gust out stall and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think overall, like, there's a case to be made for both. Um, I don't play Manaphy or Cologne. Yeah. This is just due to the idea that I hate inconsistent decks. Yeah. And, like, I find that I just want to get into the game. I don't really care about anything else. And Manaphy, historically, has been a pretty bad starter. And uh, sometimes you'll draw a Manaphy with a bunch of bricks, and that's an issue. Uh, obviously, like, Bundle is not helping that case that much. So mm -hmm. I feel like I play one or the other, but not both kind of thing. Because I feel like anytime you start fridge, you start Bidoof, like you're 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 feeling pretty good, yeah. especially with Buddy Poffin. And like you you touch on this, your ability just to find two sixty HP Pokemon now is just like unhinged at any yeah. point in the game. So, and you can replenish it as you go. So makes Manaphy a bit better. You can find it whenever you want. You find it a bit easier. Um, but I also don't think that like uh, the, the game states you described with like Lost Zone Box going second or Mirror, Mirror going second. I don't think it's unwinnable without Manaphy. No, There's it's been not. a couple times where. Yeah. Yeah, I just put down three fridge. I'm like, all right, take two, bro. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't really care that much. Um, but it, it definitely would help, right? It makes yep. your life a lot easier. So I don't know where the cut comes from, but uh, all those cards are, are good considerations. The other thing, the last thing I was considering was going down to one vessel. Uh, I play, I play one vessel. I, I actually don't like yeah, vessel do that much. I don't know. Like I've... It's super greedy, but I can see why it'd be good. Like, if you play two vessel, like, yes, it's, like, nice. But it's, like, I'm not increasing, like, my odds of seeing it early, like, by that much um it's just like i find the cards like useless once i get to the late game like i don't it's just fodder like it's what i find most of the time like obviously yeah. it's important to have like an irida target to get the lightning but, like now that i play code breakers as well like if i really need the lightning energy like i can just find it so um yeah like i don't know it's it's, it's more of an early game card and like i'd rather probably just play like some of these other cards i've said but um I don't yeah, know. I agree with you. Like, I actually find that I, I use it once, if that. Like, yeah. you need it once to get that lightning, and, like, the only reason you go to two is just to kind of, or, I guess, I, I'm at two right now, yeah. but um, you'd only play two because you want to find it early, and, like, yeah. there's not much usage for it otherwise. The only other thing I can think of is, like, late game when you're rotting back in energies and you don't have a superior, and you're just like, hey, I need these to Greninja or something. It's the only time I can really think of it, so... Um, yeah, a lot of tech options, a lot of, a lot of cool things you can kind of do with this deck. I'm excited to play it a little bit here and there. Um, I know you're probably going to play it to EOIC this weekend, so you, you guys are you're kind of a guinea pig here. We're going to yeah. see how the, uh, how the meta kind of shapes out around it or accept of it. Like, there's a good chance that it just does nothing this weekend, too. So we'll see. I think it's one of those, like, super pivot decks where if it gets really good, the meta shifts around it. It's kind of like Zard. So. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah. We will see what happens. Um, yeah, just to close out here, Neil, were there any decks that you were considering for your top three that maybe we didn't talk about yet? Yeah, Stall was up there for me. Yep. Um, 
I have played around with Future Hands a little bit. I do think it's a bit underwhelming. I, I think it's overall like you're doing what you can do. You're kind of like a worse version of Peony Maridon, it feels like a lot of the time. Uh, but it, it definitely has some potential. I definitely think that's something that could just splash immediately. Um, Lugia as well, as we touched on, I think we've touched on just about like all the decks that I think are going to make a huge splash mm -hmm. or have the potential to, but Lugia is definitely my dark horse. Um, I'm not a, a huge Lugia stand just because of its consistency issues and stuff like that. But if you're flipping heads in your aromas or whatever you're using in that deck these days, like it seems like it'd be pretty strong. Thankfully they cut Mesa Goza yep. for the most part. So that was a big one for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more attracted to the deck now because of it, but, uh, that is definitely a dark horse for me. What about you? Yeah, I think Future Box is interesting because I actually predict Future Box to be one of the most played decks of the tournament. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think it's the type of deck to me that, like, it's good to make... It's a good deck to make day two. It's a, not a good deck to go deep, in my opinion. Um, I think it's very simple and straightforward, which is, like, really attractive to a lot of people. Like, it's... Uh, obviously, you still need skill to pilot it, but it's, like, probably of the meta decks, like, the simplest one to play. It's, like, you literally just go, all right, Iron Hands, like, Ampy very much, go yeah. bear. Um... Yeah. It, it has some problems, like you're saying. Like, it's very susceptible to Vacuum, uh, which is mainly Charizard. Uh, it is a little susceptible if you don't play Gift Energy to, like, Iono. Um, so those are some problems I have with the deck. But, I mean, it's just, like, it preys on bad starts. Like, Amphi very much is a good attack. It's very linear. So I think, like, it'll be a decent deck to get through day one. I just think once you start playing top players, if you start facing a lot of Charizard at the top table, like, it'll be a little difficult to, to go deep with that deck. Uh, but I do think it'll see probably like 10% meta share as well. Um, yeah, like we touched on Lugia a bit earlier. Like I said, I gave most of my thoughts already. It's a little inconsistent, mm -hmm. super powerful when it gets going. Um, it's, I don't know, it's fallen too far from Silver Tempest Lugia for me to, to be an enjoyer. Um, yeah, exactly. I think we didn't talk about Lost Zone. Um, Lost Zone's been a little bit underwhelming to me. It just doesn't feel that good. I don't know. It feels like there's like, you're putting in so much effort for like mediocre like attackers um, yeah, I just haven't been a huge fan of the Lost Zone. I think I'm actually really glad you brought that up because I want to talk. Once you finish your thought, I want to talk about Tina for a second. Okay, I was going to actually pivot to Tina too. I, I feel like Tina is probably a little bit better in my opinion. Like you can play Leaves yeah. if you want. Like um, you could play Temple to go through Charizard as well, and it's just a big Pokemon. So, uh, but yeah, just the normal Lost Box has felt underwhelming. Like there's a lot of uh, Iron Hands around between Chen Pao and Future Box, so that's bad for your deck. And I'm just like not convinced that it's like. I don't know, like people say this Charizard matchup is good. I'm just like not convinced it's like that great. So Yeah, and like even into like Ancient Box and like random jank, like you're just not as good as you might have used to be. Um Tina has actually and I'm I i kind of forgot about this, but Tina's been surprisingly very good. Um I think people thought it was gonna kind of fall off after uh after Path and VIP left, but Tina's just good, man. Like the deck is just uh feels like one of those things where no one's prepared for it so mm -hmm. no one really like considers it into their testing but it like when going through the matchup spreads like i clicked on it on limitless like it's positive into so much of the meta mm -hmm. and uh i think tina also might see a higher play rate than what we're expecting just because of people's comfort levels with it and i think a lot of people have been playing it it's been one of the most popular decks if not the most popular deck for the last like six months <laughs> So there's a lot of comfort around that, and I think there's a lot of a lot of outs to different things as well. Like you gain a lot with whatever A spec you decide to play, um, but obviously you lose VIP pass, and I think that was a major deterrent to why people don't want to play it anymore. Yeah, I think um, I actually think his Charizard matchup is like decent. Like I actually think it's good because like it's, it plays Iron Leaves like really well, um, mm -hmm. and then like obviously you can just knock out Pidgeot with uh, whatever it's called Lost Impact. Lost Impact. So. Yeah. Yeah, I actually think it's it's poised well. I think it, it's a couple of problems. It has a really bad Chen Pao matchup, and it has a really bad uh, Lugia, Lugia matchup. So, like, those are two of the most, probably five most popular decks. But you do do well into the best deck, uh, or most popular deck. So, yeah, I, I think Lugia, or uh, Giratina is actually, like, a solid sleeper pick right now. Uh, it's definitely flying under the radar. Yeah, and if it ever gets big, like, you might see, like, Artina's playing V-Guards again and, like, stuff yeah. like that, so... You never know what's really going to happen with it, but this is a good spot for that deck to be in. Like, just totally yep. undervalued, and I just think it could be another dark horse going into the weekend here. Yeah, it, um, I was just going to say real yeah, quick, sorry. it's one of those decks where it's, like, it's very easy to tech for. Like you're saying, you literally just need to play V-Guard or Miss Energy or something. Uh, but, like, it's just so underrepresented right now. Like, no one's going to play those decks. So you're probably good right now if you're yeah. a Tino player. It feels, like, super diverse, this format. Mm -hmm. um, like, I know the last format was really diverse. This format feels equally diverse, um, at least on the surface. Yep. I'm super interested to see from an audience perspective, like, what happens this weekend. 
uh j just to like kind of sit back and just see what's what's doing well and stuff i think it's uh it's gonna be really interesting i think yeah. we're definitely like gonna learn something that we didn't know before and that was the case with laic as well there's a lot of unknowns kind of going into it and i think this is no different so really excited to see how this one turns out like my final thoughts like getting into the weekend i would think have an answer for stall would be my number one thing uh if i were to go i'd be 100 percent on having an answer for stall um, I know Chen Pao doesn't do a great job of that, but there are a couple things you can do. I've seen some mini ors, I've seen some double clones. I don't think it helps, <laughs> but uh, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, uh, my, I, I make sure uh, have an answer to stall and beat Zard. My my answer to stall is just don't face stall. <laughs> yeah, just don't play it. I actually think Chen Pao can beat the Pidgeot version like pretty consistently. Uh, I just yeah. it's I don't think it can beat Snorlax that consistently. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So our nature of discarding energies is quite punishing combined with airy now like yeah I, I just think um what's it called like it's a, we've always said this right like stall like no matter how good stall is it's not gonna see like crazy amount of play right like most people just don't like playing stall or like um if this is like their only like if they people just play like a few tournaments like they just they're not gonna play stall like people just don't find it some people find playing stall fun but a lot of people just don't find playing stall fun so mm -hmm. it's always yeah. gonna be underrepresented so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm I'm really interested. I hope you're excited to go over across the pond there. Have some mm -hmm. uh, what what do they what do they drink out there these days? What's the most popular beer in England? I have no I idea. Know. Used to be uh used to be, Guinness used to be huge there. Now it's kind of fallen off. People don't like dark beers as much anymore. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a huge dark beer fan. Uh, yeah. Really? No, it's not my thing. I've been to the I've been my to first Ireland. Time I've had Guinness there, but I still didn't like that much. Yeah, same. The that's what I was gonna say. My first time having a drink, I was like fourteen, and we like landed in Ireland. I was like hammered off like three sips. It was nuts, <laughs> and that's when I learned like I think I'm gonna like dark beer. <laughs> to this day, I don't mind dark beer. I like it better than light beer. That's for sure. How do I'm just I'm not a huge like beer drinker. I feel like I, I prefer light beer to dark beer. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Fair enough. We'll have a beer discussion one day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, all y'all have fun in England. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Excel Center is really good. Don't eat the... There's one burger place in there. It was so grief. Mm. I forget what the hell it was called. They've had like ICs and like Worlds there twice or three times now. And like the, the food and the venue is so expensive. So yeah. London is just... My one criticism of London as a city is it is ridiculously expensive. Like outrageously expensive. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if there's a more expensive city I've been to to play Pokemon before. Like definitely not. So... Uh, and like the location of the Excel Center is so far away from yeah, the Yeah, it's like core. so out of the way. Yeah, yeah so yeah. if it's your first time, have fun. It's a, it's definitely <laughs> an experience. I'll say that. London is a great city, though. Just make sure you venture away from the the venue. So yeah, yeah. Like like we showed in our video last week, right? With uh with us in the elevator. Yeah. Uh, have fun. <laughs> have fun at these things. This is the most important thing. Venture outside. See the sights. Like you're gonna. Some people you'll never go back to to London, right? No. Enjoy yourself. See the sights. Go to Buckingham. See what's up have fun have yeah. fun everyone all right that is it for us we'll see you after uic uh we're gonna get matt back on at some point too they'll probably be next week so we'll nice. have a nice little ldf episode for you next week all right guys good luck take Peace. it easy